please turn with me in your Bibles. Acts 1, 1, 11. Theophilus, the first scroll I wrote, concerned everything Jesus did and taught from the beginning, right up into the day when he was taken into heaven. Before he was taken up, working in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus instructed the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about God's kingdom. While they were eating together, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. He said, this is what you heard from me. John baptized with water, but only in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. As a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus replied, it isn't for you to know the time or the seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. Rather, you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going away, and as they were staring toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this June sermon series is called Pack Your Bags, and it is in honor of all things summer and the places we go. Vacation, camp, Ozark Mission Project, Youth 2019. We're on. We're out. We're out of here, right? To the lake, you got to pack a bag. If you're moving, you pack a lot of bags, right? Pack your bags because we're being sent. This is a series based on scriptures for the month about the commissioning we have, the sending out that God has in store for us as disciples. What it takes to go out in all the world, what it takes to do as Jesus commanded. So the questions we ask, where are we going? What do we gotta take? How will we get there from here? So in Acts chapter 1, Jesus is doing his own going. This is the ascension story of, of the Sunday before Pentecost, right? Next week we do the flames, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church. But it is this moment where Jesus is departing. After 40 days of being present with the disciples, post-resurrection, Reliving the truths that he taught, reliving the proof of who he is, who he was, and who he will yet be. He does his own going. But he leaves them with the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit to do their own going and sharing about who he is and what he did. So he says that in verse 8, the power of the Holy Spirit has come to you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now for us, as we continue to wait for Christ to come again, this is still our commissioning. Those aren't our geographic places. So we might think of our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth like this, right here, here, over there, and the ends of the earth, right? Because right here is where it starts, in this church in your place where you come with your families to witness and to share in the love of Jesus Christ, where you gather something into the spirit to grow in your faith, right? To be filled up in order for the sending out. It happens right here where we gather in large groups like this and also hopefully you've got some fellowship groups from friend groups, youth groups, Sunday school groups, you've got disciple Bible studies. Some of these things can happen in short term specific groups like Ozark Mission Project, or other work teams. Uh, the, even the leadership team, y'all, is a place of growth in, in spiritual witness to each other and faith and faithful development. By witnessing and sharing how Christ has moved and touched and changed each of our own lives, right? That's the definition of witnessing. Sharing what Christ has done in each of our lives. We do that in a sense that we can make time to talk to each other, intentionally find ways to share about how Christ has changed us. So the Sunday school classes we've always had and the youth group ministry we've always had, this really comes out of our, our Methodist tradition 
from John Wesley and his brother gathering with their friends at Oxford and having their holy club, their Jesus meeting. They're come to Jesus meeting where they sit and they talk to each other and you sit down. It's mandatory attendance too. You have to show up and you have to say what scriptures you read, what sins you committed during the week. That must have been fun to talk about. And then you had a chance to say, how is it with your soul? You had to be open and share it and let the Holy Spirit within you be revealed to the Holy Spirit within the others in the room. You had to answer those main questions. So when you think about that duplicated in our small groups and whatever forms they are, the holy fellowship that we create, those are the spaces where the spirit happens right here to equip us, to shape us, to deepen our faith, to get us ready to go out there, which is the bigger here. Bryant, Benton, Celine County, Parts of Little Rock even, Alexander, just wherever the here extends to in your circle. How far is your reach? Where's your job? Where are your hobbies? Where does it take you from, from your place right here to your place in the bigger here? Where do you witness to people about who you are in Christ in the larger arena? That's our Judea. If our Jerusalem is right here, Judea is just in the larger area that we live. This part of God's great kingdom on earth that we call Arkansas. It is our Judea. Which means then, friends, that we, we build good, good community and we live out loving the least of these in our here. That's where we're tasked immediately. So follow that narrative a little further. What was next? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. That's over there. There are barriers, real or imagined. There are places that we've created where we don't want to know who's over there, right? Where we've let the over there's be over there and we'll be over here. So we've got those kinds of separations, those, those divisions. It's not a geography or a place anymore. It is a mental understanding of who we are and who they are. So for the disciples, you have to remember that Samaria was full of Samaritans. And Samaritans were the people with whom they did not associate. They were others, right? So you remember the, the young ruler, the wise legal expert who came up to Jesus and said, how do I inherit eternal life? Remember that? And the guy, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God Almighty. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes, yeah, who's my neighbor? Because it sounds like maybe there's a loophole in that. If I can just find it. Because there's some folks that I can't imagine being my neighbor. And you're telling me the story of the guy, the good Samaritan who came by the man wounded on the road and the priest walked by and the other religious leader walked by, but it was the Samaritan who helped him. And Jesus said, what did he tell him at the end? So go and do likewise. And the man heard, you want me to go and be like them? And you want me to like them? That's a lot to take in. So we have to imagine who are the people over there with whom we're not ready to really be. Who is it? Who are the sinners we're excluding intentionally or unintentionally, even though we are two sinners? Who are the people that it takes extra effort intentionally to let our Jesus meet their Jesus? Who are the people that, that we are faithfully, that we seek first to understand in order to be understood? Who is it? Different ethnic groups, age groups, socioeconomic groups. Is it LGBTQ? Is it atheists and agnostics? I have to mention that because it really came up this week at annual conference. The, the guest speaker who was the dean of Duke Divinity School, his name is Greg Jones. He referenced an author who wrote a book several years ago called Nothing to be Afraid of. Is that what it was? Nothing to be Frightened of. And within that book, the author, and he said, I wrote this book when I was thinking about what happens to a religious person who lives their whole life devout and then at the end decides that they are no longer religious. That what they thought they believed, they no longer believe. Which is really the growing population in our world, is it not? The, it's not just I don't believe in God, but I, I'm, not, I'm just not going to be religious anymore, Right? I've done away with it. I've stepped away from religion and church and all things because I'm just over it. But the author said, a line in the book, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. 
If you know someone who's stepped away from faith, who's let go of it, who's no longer going to church for a reason, there's lots of them. But if you know someone who's in that, I want you to hear that kernel of truth, that kernel of hope, that kernel of longing and yearning that I think is in each and every person created by God that says, I will miss God if I'm not with God. Recognizing it's there, but, and that I would miss him. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. There's opportunity in that, right? There's opportunity to witness and to share and to, and to say that what we build on is the longing for knowing and then turn knowing into believing again and turn believing into being. Our ends of the earth. These are the places, the people we can't even imagine and the places we've never considered. The ends of the earth. Sounds to me just like Jesus meant it then. You don't even know what's out there. They thought it was flat, right? <laughs> you don't even know what's out there or who's out there, or what they need or what they're like. I got to tell you, friends, that's a destination that we have to imagine. We have to imagine that's the end game. The places and the people whom we can't even imagine. And that God is asking us to pack our bags to go there, ultimately. But the trick is that we start right here. The greater connection right here, the personal faith development right here, to be ready to even go here and then over there. Let's be honest, friends, most of the time we get stuck right here or here. We don't even dip our toes over there if we can help it, right? It is true that our witnessing tends to get delegated, relegated, stuck, closest in to what's comfortable and known. So you think about when I said earlier the class meeting style of the, of the Holy Club, John Wesley and his brother, and they'd go ask each other, how is it with your soul? There's a point and a purpose to that kind of functioning small fellowship group. If you're not in a group, you need to find one. If the one that you're in doesn't do these next three things, then you need to start a new one. Or ask your group to redevelop and concentrate on these three things. Does your group do this? Challenge us. Does your group challenge you to let go of the sin that you've come to love and depend on every day? Does your group challenge you to be the best you that you can be? Does your group affirm the gifts that you have in the spirit? Does your group affirm the gifts that you have in the spirit to claim them and to use them? Does your group offer you a place to dream the things that you wouldn't normally feel empowered to dream? To think of the places of the ends of the earth and how to get there. We need to see where we are, who we are, and where we need to go and plan ways to get there. We will talk through this sermon series in June about what it takes to pack for this journey, to dig in and to hold on and to think of some new places and some new groups to be because Jesus asked us to go. Fortunately, Jesus gave us, best of all, God is with us, the Holy Spirit within us to help us along the journey. I got to tell you this story real quick. The opening worship service at annual conference, we'd gathered We'd celebrated, we'd done communion, and a bunch of kids went up on the stage, and the bishop had a benediction. Now, Sadie Joy Ledbetter was right there. <laughs> and the questions went like this. The bishop said, friends, remember, best of all, and the kids shout, God is with us. And he said, in the name of the Father, and the kids said, go. In the name of the Son, and the kids said, go. In the name of the Holy Spirit, and Sadie Ledbetter leaned forward and went, go! <laughs> yeah, she said it with conviction. And she said it, and the way it went, my friends, it was like the youngest amongst us were telling the oldest ones to get up and go. That they are counting on us to get stuck, unstuck from right here and get over there and out there. And to do it for their sake. Go! She said, where do you want to go? How do you want to get there? Where are you starting this journey? What's next? How will you pack your bags? The ends of the earth await. We, we do that. And we start right here. 
in the gift that's offered for us, in the celebration of the, of the commissioning Christ offers by forgiving us of our sins, by including us in the body of believers, those who are gifted with the opportunity to go into all the world, to teach his good name, to baptize the nations and to share his love so that all who come to believe in him shall not die, but have eternal life. So I ask you friends, in that name of God, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, will you prepare your hearts to receive this gift by taking a moment of prayer and offering your confession to ask and receive your pardon? Let us pray. Merciful are you, Lord God. We give you thanks and we give you the glory for the way you have presented mercy and grace to us and the power you have to receive our sins and to forgive them and to make us new people and that you've put the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us to help us grow in faith, share our gifts and grow your kingdom for your son's sake. So we thank you, Lord God, for the forgiveness and the pardon that you offer today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. When Jesus was betrayed, he first ate dinner with his friends. It was the last meal that they would share together. They didn't yet know what was really going to happen. But he took what was common to them in the daily bread. And he gave thanks and he broke the bread and he gave it to the disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body and it's given for you. When you gather, do this in remembrance of me. And still not quite understanding, they saw him take the cup that was common to them and give thanks to God again and say, this is my blood of the new covenant. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. When you're together, do this in remembrance of me. And so we ask today that the Lord God helps us to remember, to remember who we are, whose we are and where we're going. And in the power of the Holy Spirit within us and the gifts of Jesus Christ. So, Lord God, we ask that you pour out the Holy Spirit, not just on us gathered here, but on these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we will be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast together at the heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen.